Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia. Welcome back to another early game playbook video featuring King of the Black Mountains, Zhang Yan. So Zhang Yan is the last bandit faction we're covering here in 190, and he plays very differently from most factions in the game in that he has a special feature where if you go on the attack, you can trigger an ambush battle on offense, which actually changes battle dynamic quite a bit and allows a different playstyle when you're playing the game. So he's quite interesting. But before we dive into all that, let's first talk about him generally. So his background, King of the Black Mountains, gives him Ignore Forest penalty and also 25% post-battle loot income. So the Ignore Forest penalty plays into the fact that you're going to be fighting a lot more ambush battles and in ambush battles, your units always start out in the forest coming in to ambush a narrow path where the enemy is marching through. So that kind of helps you get more speed coming out of the forest. There is also 25% post-battle loot income. This is actually quite underrated. So post-battle loot income actually contribute quite a bit to your overall economy throughout the gameplay. It just doesn't feel that way, but if you look at the post-game screen once you finish a campaign, you often make you know hundreds of thousands from post-battle loot income. So if you could get multiplier on that quite early on, like you can with Zhang Yan, you can actually increase your wealth throughout the game. But we're really not going to be able to take advantage of that until we get through the early game, have our armies, and be able to fight more battles. So that's his bonus. And faction specialization is quite uh, basically not there. You know, it says opportunist alignment, but basically what this means is your faction unique building has three different options to build. One to increase your relationship with the High Empire, give you a bit more administrator, and give you a bit of public order. Another option that would give you your army limit and loot income. And finally, there's a unique option where you can improve your diplomatic relationships with the Yellow Turban factions and improve your spy limit. So the problem with this building was it was designed very early on when the game was released with just the base game. So there was just the 190 start and this building was kind of interesting and the bandit factions were not revamped. So before, the best option was improve your relationship with the High Empire factions, get more administrator positions, which is great because administrators vastly improve your economy, and you get public order. But with the changes to the bandit faction in 1.5, this option has now become pretty bad because underlings, which are the administrators for the bandit factions now, are much worse than administrators. And they provide less bonus to economy, they provide less a discount to the corruption and public order is also no longer a good thing for the bandit faction because high public order actually causes problems for bandits and bandits are also encouraged to take less settlements and take more counties so you really don't have a lot of space for underlings but this branch of the chain is pretty much not in favor after the bandit revamp and the relationship with yellow turban has always been very gimmicky and has doesn't have a lot of value I think this is more of reference to the fact that the Black Mountains and Zhang Yan used to be part of Yellow Turban movement, and when the Yellow Turban movement fell apart, they basically retreated back to their homelands in the mountains and became bandits. But this clearly doesn't work very well in the game, especially if you move on to the 194 campaign, when there's almost no Yellow Turban factions on the map to begin with. So that leaves us with only one option, and probably the best option after the bandit revamp, and that is to get a little bit of increase to your army limit and also to your loot income. So that's going to play out very nicely for bandit factions, and that's probably the only route that I'm going to recommend you guys to take with his unique building, and that's pretty much all the faction specialization there is to him. As for unique units, he has three of them. He has Black Mountain Marauders, which are dual-wielding axe unit that causes scare and guerrilla deployment. You have Black Mountain Outlaws, which are the spear units that are anti-cavalry, also causes spare and uh, scare and guerrilla deployment. And finally, you have Black Mountain Hunters. These are hybrid axe and bow units that also causes scare and guerrilla deployment. So the trend here is either you're in an ambush fight where these guys get to rush out at the enemy, cause scare, and do a lot of charge damage, or you're in an open field fight where you can guerrilla deploy them into some forest where you can hide and charge out and cause scare and you know do damage. You're basically not going to run these guys as your front line. None of them have range block chance. They're not really going to stand up a chance against enemy cavalry despite the fact you have some spear units. 
Uh, so these guys are really just good for ambush battles, and that's kind of the trend with Zhang Yan. And finally, we have Mercenary Treaties. This is unique to all bandit factions. We talked plenty about it in our other bandit guides, so I'm just going to skip over it. Obviously, try to take advantage of this as much as possible to make friends and also to make a little bit of money. And there is really no noteworthy characters. We can just ignore these. Yu Du and Li Da Mu are both these yellow turban bandit characters who are active in this region. They're given to you, but they don't have uh, very different unique backgrounds uh, or such. So we're probably just actually going to get rid of our entire court. And this guide, unlike our previous guide, uh, we did a guide before for Zhang Yan where we turtled up in the Black Mountains for many, many turns until we come out with a big army and wiped out Zhengjiang and we controlled the north. This guide would be very similar to Zhengjiang's recent guide and we're going to migrate to Shoufang. So Shoufang over here is literally the best commander you can have for bandit factions in the north part of the map because it is the only commander in the north part of the map that have three counties. And each county brings a set amount of banditry income for bandit factions, so the more county you have, the more income you're going to have. So Shoufang plus it has a harbor, so this is where we're going. There is really no other playstyle I can think of playing as bandits than to migrate to Shuofang if you're in the north. So this guy's gonna feel a, very similar to Zhengjiang's guide, except for we're gonna make a few more careful moves, because in comparison to Zhengjiang, Zhengjiang is a little weaker, and the start is a little bit more difficult because you have Zhengjiang as your neighbor, and she's gonna be a little bit more aggressive. So let's hop into game. We'll be showcasing this once again on Legendary Legendary 40 Minute. So see you guys in game. Alrighty, we're loaded up in here. Establish your power. Lord Zhang Yet, the warlords of China have descended into civil war. Perhaps the time has come for you to descend from the mountains and make yourself known. Opportunity is found in chaos if you have the strength to seize it. You have found allies in the warlords before, and there may yet to be more to be found with the strongest of them. Yet any who oppose you, even the tyrant himself, must be crushed by the power of the Black Mountain Bandits. Alright, so claim high empire regions and be wary of Zhengjiang. And our first mission is for Taste of Victory to engage in the army in front of us. It's a Han army led by Yang Biao. Uh, so let's first take a look at things. We are here uh, in the Black Mountain Valley here. We have Yemen, which is uh, right here. And they have a lumberyard for the county. We're going to grab that as part of our first turn missions. And then we're probably just going to dive straight for Shuofang. And there's a few maneuvers we could make uh, in the beginning to make life simple. And uh, since we covered the bandit faction quite a bit now, we're going to skim over some of these things. So obviously, starting out similar to Zhengjiang's uh, playstyle, our reforms are all in the north. And that's a great thing because the bandit map, the northern ones are much better than the southern ones. And some of the best ones are here, uh, where you can gain 15% campaign movement range each. All the purple ones here give you minus 5% corruption. This one right next to you give you 5% replenishment. Very, very good. The red one here gives you 15% income from banditry. Also pretty good. And all these nomadic ones give you access to different nomadic cavalry units, which will bolster your lack of strong shot cavalry. So we're going to dive for movement first. We're going to go this way because we're not really going to have an army early on. So we're not going to go straight for replenishment. But after you get your movement reforms, definitely consider going down this purple route here just to grab these uh, more useful reforms for building up your faction. Uh, the population growth obviously is great as well. All right, so we have that all set up. Let's take a look at our items. All right, we got a silver and a bronze. Not a bad haul. Uh, you always start out with two bronze items. You always start out with stone pig and iron steak. You have a pretty big roster, but as you can see, they all hate you, and that's why we're going to say goodbye to them. Your leader also has a Silver Axe. Uh, it's not that great, but definitely improves his damage early on, so definitely keep that. Uh, before your first battle, you can equip your characters uh, whoever you want, just to give your leader more stat, because we're going to have to feature Zhang Yan in our first few fights. Alright, so we are all set up here. There's nothing special about Yang Biao. No special background, no special traits. Uh, we can just straight up kill him. I've seen the traits before. It's not impressive. You can definitely duel to get experience. And remember when you duel, you want to be the one challenging him for maximum 
income. Uh, we're surrounded by enemy factions in the beginning. High Empire, High Empire, High Empire, Yellow Turban. So there's no trade deal uh, to do right away. So we can get the fight started. But this still means we have to fight carefully and not take losses. So a lot of uh, Zhang Yan to use. As you can see, offensive ambush triggered. I hate ambush fights, but mainly because I play with huge range armies and the range auto fire is broken in ambush battles. But if you play with, you know, these units that are designed as shock units to charge in at close range, uh, ambush fights are very good for you. So let's jump in here. Alrighty, we're loaded up. So this is your standard ambush battle. Uh, they're basically on this route. They're marching to somewhere and we ambush them and we can deploy and they can't deploy. That's key. Uh, the trick here for us is we want to put all the experience as much as possible on Zhang Yan. He starts out at level 1. If you could level him up to level 3 early on, you get access to reach and you'll be able to march your troop out much easier. Uh, we can definitely get a duel started. The duel is going to give us most of the experience. So we can actually do this and he cannot do he will duel us it's always set up where he will end up willing to duel you but first we're going to charge these cavalry it's slow for them to respond there we go challenge him to a duel and we want to fight him and we have mending this is a new bandit skill it gives you 50 percent armor 50 percent melee evasion and some heal and you want to pop this pretty much right away uh, for the armor and melee evasion boost as soon as the fight start. You waste a little bit of the healing. Uh, it's healing over time, so it'd be okay. You get four charges. The fight should go pretty fast. Uh, he's rather weak. And this should net you enough experience to rank up to rank two. Uh, hopefully we get to kill some of these cavalry afterward. Uh, if we want, we could have some of our units come help, but they're really not here to take experience away from us. So hopefully we'll be able to kill him and then the morale shock would make these guys want to route that way we can just chase them down for a few kills before they completely route because we are probably not going to be able to outrun them there we go all right, they're gonna charge us. You see they've lost only three points of morale, so they're still pretty excited to fight us. Okay, we get on our horse first. We'll probably take a bit of damage here, which is fine. Oh, uh, there's some morale weakness right there. They start realizing their general died. You just use this whenever you have it. You have to select a target, just select yourself. I find it easier to select it here on the panel rather than try to click on the unit. You can also heal your allies and it's a range heal. There's a range uh, effect, 35 meters. So if your generals are staying together, you can just heal, uh, let's say your friend here and you also get the effect. So always try to heal an ally because by the time you reach them, you can uh, enjoy the benefit yourself as well. But if you heal yourself, sometimes they might be out of range. All right, we'll try to chase them down, but as you can see, we're we're faster. We have two extra speed on them. I don't know if we can actually get to them. We're just trying to milk as much experience out of this first fight as we can, because we want to level up. All right, they're gone. Let's go back to our second target. They're somewhere in this forest. There they are. Fight. Heal yourself whenever you can. The armor and melee evasion is great. And then we just try to give chase. We're not going to be able to kill many. Kill only 25. There's only 61 of them, including the general. So we can kill. Oh, he's running the wrong way. So we do get some kills here. So this result's going to vary, but Zhang Yan definitely can solo this, and you definitely want him to do so. Alrighty. So we'll get income here. And we finish our first mission. Second mission is to capture the lumberyard here, get support the people, extra experience for a glorious victory. And if we take a look, we have 4,012 experience points. So 3,000 is what we need to level up to the first tier. 
Uh, the 1,000 from the event obviously helped, but even without it, we'll have 3,012. So that was enough. First pick up flexibility. This will give you redeployment cost benefits for the whole faction. Also plus 5% replenishment for own army. And our big goal is to try to get reach because 25 campaign movement range is going to help us a lot when you want to migrate. And plus the loot system just makes bandit factions harder to move because you'd be overburdened with loot a lot and you end up uh, costing you campaign movement range. So this obviously counteracts that. Anyhow, continue with our fight here in the lumberyard. So by the same logic, you want to use giant to chase down all the units. Uh, I'm going to be fighting it and cutting that part out. There will be towers, but don't worry, just charge him in. He's very strong, he has a heal ability, armor ability. Just run down the enemy, get yourself as much experience as possible, and hopefully we'll come out with um, enough for rank 3. Uh, most often the case, you're not going to have enough, and you're probably just going to have to uh, wait out a few turns, because there's passive experience gains for your leader. So he'll be able to rank up somewhere on the way uh, of your migration. But let's cut this part out. See you guys at then. Alrighty. So I got a little greedy chasing them, and uh, we got a lot of kills, but we took a lot of arrow damage chasing them outside of the lumberyard. But that's totally fine, because we'll be uh, summoning everyone back so they'll be full healed. We'll occupy right here. And now we can make our diplomacy deal, because we're actually bordering a uh, neutral faction. We got some extra experience for capturing. Uh, I don't think it's enough for level up, though. We're close. You see, we're only 300 away. Right here... Uh, we have access to Liu Yu, so we can actually trade with him on turn 1. And since our units are all full health, we can get the best value with him. What we're going to do first before we deal with him is that we're going to look at our family tree. So we do have our son, Zhang Fang, who actually has a unique background, and uh, we'll definitely keep him. Uh, he's currently heir, he's only 7, he's 11 years away from becoming uh, of age, so that would take 55 turns. So ideally, you want to move your heir to someone else, but as the bandit, you actually don't need to be family. So any other character you get when you are recruiting, if you like them, make them your heir right away. It doesn't affect you at all as a bandit faction. Your wife, however, is someone you don't need. She is not a bandit character. So if we take a look here, look at her skill tree. She does not have Poison Wally, which makes her effectiveness for your faction uh, amount to about zero. So we're going to get some value out of our wife. We're going to marry her away on turn one just to get a little bit of diplomatic point. It's going to cost us a thousand for the divorce, which is not great, but it will buy us some peace and give us a little bit of money back as well. So just go ahead, invest this a thousand, divorce her, and then enter into our first negotiation with Liu Yu. So we're going to offer him marriage to his son. They'll be a happy couple together. He will pay us 7.3. Now this value is going to change depending on how healthy your army is. But basically, we can get a lot of gold out of this. And on top of this, we want a trade deal uh, right off the bat. Obviously, the value is going to also shift depending on how healthy your armies are. In our case, very healthy. And then we can look at his starting items in case there's something we want. A uh, unique item. Fun. Uh, there's really nothing I want, so we're just going to gun for money. As much of it as possible. Probably in the ballpark of around 200. Uh, maybe a little less. 150, 148, about 1,480 gold uh, over the course of 10 turns. It's going to basically pay you back for the divorce plus a little bit more. And you get the trade deal, which has value per turn. And he'll like you more because you're now family, basically. But this will buy us a little piece uh, from our eastern border. Our early goal is to actually to lose our capital. I'll talk about why a bit later. But first, let's get this deal pushed through. Alright, it's it's not a lot of gold, so if you want to go for his items, like say grab like a silver item, uh, you can definitely do that as well, because you can get more value from that silver item uh, after the fact. So this is our capital. It's not a very good capital for the bandit faction anymore, just because of the limited number of uh, counties you hold, and it's also under a lot of pressure, with Zhengjiang about to start her faction out over here, and Yuan Shao is always going to be a strong power over here, Gong Sun Zan is going to come from this direction, so you're going to be in a lot of trouble if you stay here, and you're not going to get a lot out of it. So, it's better to move your capital to Shuofang. It's expensive to move capital in the game, it costs about, I think, 10,000 actually, not 5,000. Uh, it will increase as the game moves on, uh, eventually to like 25,000. 
uh, but it's expensive. So what you want to do is you want some faction to help you take this town, if possible. Most of the time, the AI actually don't help you do that. And the reason why we want to lose our capital and move our capital is because you can only build your faction unique building in your capital. So right now, it's currently here. We start out with a level one version. And as you can see, the early version of this building gives you income from looting settlements and post battle loot income faction wide. Very helpful. And it still has the old economic building discount. This is a relic of the pre bandit uh, changes. I don't know if CA is going to go back and change this because Wuxing Synergy was removed uh, for most of the other bandit units buildings. As you can see here, you don't actually get that Wuxing Synergy discount. But for some of the older buildings that are shared with the High Empire, you still have it. Like the bandit one, oh, I guess they have it. I guess it's just Tribute Hall. The Tribute Hall is the only one that doesn't give a certain set discount. It just gives a flat discount to all sorts of uh, Wuxing Synergy. So it's like straight up minus 10% cost reduction. Uh, this is a great building, by the way. We talked about this in our other bandit guide as well. Um, so here we have this building. Uh, we have economy grow as our next mission whenever we build something here. Um, back to talking about this building. So it branched out at tier 3. You have the option of going for more post-battle loot income and available armies. Or you have the option to go for improved diplomatic relationship with all your turban factions, which is useless in my opinion. They can't do diplomatic deals anyways, so... Why do you want a good relationship? Just for peace? Really makes no sense. And then lastly here, you have improved diplomatic relationship with the High Empire and administrator position. Used to be really good. Not only can you make friends and get better deals, you get two whole new administrators, which is very powerful in the game. But underlings, if we take a look, we start out with one. Underlings give you 10% income to all sources. Whereas administrators give you 15%. Administrators give you minus 30% corruption. Underlings give you minus 20, but it increases the corruption of enemy adjacent commanderies, which is fine if you have a really, really nice frontier commandery that is making you a ton of money. And you're like damaging the AI economy, which actually doesn't hurt the AI because AI has extreme discounts on everything. So they don't actually need that much money. You're actually hurting yourself in diplomacy because you could demand more money if the AI had more income, right? They spend less, but what they are willing to pay you in diplomacy is based on how much money they're making. So it's actually hurting yourself by making their economy worse, or else you could extract better diplomatic deals with them in terms of money. So the reason why we only got 148 per turn from Liu Yu is because his economy is deemed not strong. If he was making 5,000 per turn, he'll be giving us you know, more money per turn. So underlings, not that great. So that leaves us with only this route here that ends up giving us post battle loot income, 25%, 25% income from looting settlements. This is where when we take a settlement, there's a post battle set, uh, screen there where you can make money from that and three available armies. What's powerful here is actually the three available armies because we talked a lot about sharing the spoils and using the spoil income 200%. So each army increase here is actually a 200% boost to your banditry food and banditry income in your best commandery, and in this case, Shuofang. So it's going to amount up to about 1,300-ish gold per army. Uh, so it's going to be very good to get some extra army. So definitely go for this route. And remember, you can only build this in your capital. I would not invest in it right now because our intention is to lose this site. Uh, and to move our capital over. Uh, what we're going to do first is convert because conversion costs do not receive the discount from um, your economy grow. So it's better to convert it to the bandit version first before triggering your economy grow. And for our army, we're going to actually disband everything and we're actually going to banish all our characters except for Zhang Yet and our son. But we can't banish anyways. So we're going to summon him back. Because we did all the diplomatic deals we need to do. And just before we say goodbye to them, the reason why we're saying goodbye to them is A, bad traits, unhappy with us, not sentinel bandits. Pillager, not bad, 25% post battle loot income, and you can get shamelessness that for another 25%, and then a faction wide bonus. You can play like double your post battle loot income if you're commanding with him. But why, I mean, why do we keep someone like this? He's weak. And then Wang Dong, Mastermind, some spying bonus, hates us. Superstitious, honest, modest. So he actually has good traits, 
But then the strategist version of the bandit tree is not that good. Stalker, snipe is okay. You get poison arrow and snipe. They remain hidden, allowing you to fire. But the requirement is you have to be in a forest. So I guess it works for uh, ambush battles where you can manually select with your archer units, have them snipe from the forest and remain hidden. But you can do this with any bandit uh, strategist. So we don't need to keep him. Li Damu is actually one of the decent characters here. Enforcer is an excellent background bonus because it makes the whole army reduce penalty from desire for higher office. But it's not good enough to keep him early on because of the satisfaction situation. And Yu Du, Escape Convict, 25% chance of evading capture post battle. That's only useful if you lose those battles. So we're gonna say goodbye to all our characters. We're gonna come to court. And we're just going to banish them. We get 800 gold per banish. And it hurts satisfaction. But the only people that will actually get hit by this satisfaction is our son. But since he's next in line right now, he should be fine. He shouldn't leave us. And I haven't seen a baby leave of action in a long time. Yeah, I don't think it's it's possible. They can die prematurely. But I think Zhang Fang lives uh, to adulthood always. All right, so our roster is cleaned out. Uh, we're fine. We're waiting for better characters to show up in our recruitment pool. We got as much money as possible from them. We recalled our leader so we can summon him back here because it's going to be closer than him walking back. It's going to be a little bit faster. And we have the buildings all set up, so it's time to move on to next turn. All righty, so we're over here. Uh, we can probably trigger our... Your comic role right now just to level this building up that's the only thing we are going to use that for you could wait like eight turns in after you arrive to use the economy grow but i think that's actually not worth it it's better to get this going to tier three as fast as possible so you get that huge retinue to defend it with and we're pretty much going to defend this lumber yard here as our position in the north we're going to try to lose this, but we're going to try to hold this so that we can summon armies here in the future rather than having to come out of all the way over here, sail down, and arrive. That's kind of our goal here. Tribute Hall started. Summon Zhang Yan back onto the map. And there's a little bit of micro you need to do here. So you want to position him on the other side, and you also want to change him to sharing the spoils. Not really for economic boost, but just for a loot in decrease. So you get more movement from him. And if we look at his experience, it gone up a little bit. You see it's 7,987. It was 600 something. So by next turn, we'll passively arrive at level three, give ourselves reach and be able to move faster. So that was the whole reason why we had him solo the first two armies. Uh, but let's continue. Alrighty, uh, we trigger Yukami Grow and we passively uh, leveled up. Growing Might's our next one whenever we recruit two other units. We can pick up reach, very key here. Switch our position to march. And we're just going to go straight for the river here. We're going to have to go through Zheng Jiang's land. That's fine. Uh, it's a trespass. Uh, she's going to hate us for it. But she's if she declares war on you, or if the early game dilemma triggers and asks you to declare war with her, it's fine. You want her to come and destroy your town so that you get a free move with the capital. If she hesitate and do not come after your town, then you have to pay up and move your capital manually. So keep your eye on characters. Uh, you tend to get a lot of armor playing as Zhang Yan. I think I tested it out many times and just tons of armor show up for whatever reason. But your economy grow has started. So let's get this two turns to build to tier two. And then on the final turn of economy grow, level it up to tier three. So the faster you get this done, the faster your units can muster up. And at the same time, this building is actually not giving us much, right? We're not fighting. So we actually want to demolish this to give us a little bit of money back. And we actually want to downgrade the town as well to get a little bit more money back. 300 here. Sometime the display errors goes to one and then it changes back to what it should be. All right, let's continue. All right, so Zheng Jiang's headed over here for her early game mission to take the first uh, tool maker there. We are just busy getting into the water. Sometimes she really hates you for this trespass and she might declare war on you very early on. And that's okay. Don't freak out. And we got Guo Jia. So, recruit. Now, Guo Jia is an excellent character for next in line potentially. Uh, but uh, if you're worried about your boy, 
um, for whatever reason you think he might leave you, which I don't think is actually possible, uh, you can put him as an underling as well. The burn buff gives all income boost, so that's obviously great. Uh, he starts out rank 3, so he's going to be a little bit unhappy with you. But his trait's actually not that great for underling, just because he's so far away from some of these bonuses. So I tend to actually just make him our um, next in line right away. You get minus 10% corruption. It doesn't kick in early on, but eventually it's going to uh, matter quite a bit. And you get extra trade route if you get this one active. It'll take a while. You probably want to get him resourcefulness first. Depends on what character you get. You don't always get Guotia, so you can figure out what you want to do with him. Uh, in our case, we are going to make him our heir. Swap him. Uh, yeah, I think this is how you do it. Wait. Huh. I think CA need to fix this. Because you should be able to get them as next in line, even if they're not your family as band of factions. Zhang Yan must still have some old... Uh, must have some old code where you have to be family to be able to take this position. Well, no matter. Then make him your underling. Get some income boost while you're waiting. And it also makes him happy. Interesting. I guess I have to report that. Yeah, revamping the benefaction, they definitely overlooked a few things. They just recently added the skill tree update for Zhang Yan. He previously didn't have these bandit skills. Oh, speaking of the skill tree, since it's different now. So you have Mending, you have Binding Fury, which is the standard champion one for High Empire factions, and you get the bandit uh, vanguard ability. So you actually don't have anything super unique, you just have a combination of different classes. Uh, not the most exciting skill tree in the world, but it's fine. You also have Greedy, uh, which is fine. It doesn't hurt you as a leader. Stubborn's good for Unbreakable, even though... And, and you have Fatigue Immunity on your armor, so combination pretty solid. Uh, Carelessness, eh. I doubt we get ambushed. We're the one doing the ambushing. All right, let's continue. That's a interesting f situation there, where we can't make him our... Uh, next in line. I'll try again next turn. It might be a turn thing, like we just recruited him, but we'll see. Alrighty, let's hop into the river. And we'll get over here. Uh, we could deck him out for a, a bit of uh, discount. So we want expertise. 15% construction discount. We want to upgrade this to tier 3. And then we also want to downgrade this. Okay. All right, let's continue. All right. Well, I'm happy. Ooh, war, war between Gongs and Zan. Okay. Well, I'm happy having him as our underling. I'm just curious if we can. Hmm. Then it must be a broken code. Interesting. Uh, do we fun? If you want him, it's fine. But Go Master is not as good for bandits because you don't have access to Silk and Spice income. So we're just going to pass here. Continue moving him. He'll get there next turn. So around turn 7, you'll be able to have Shuofang. You still have to build it up though. So it's a rather slow start. These migration tactics are slow. And that's totally fine. Uh, we have the buildings going on. Let's continue. So Zheng Jiang is offering us uh, military access. We have to pay him a ton or pay her a ton. We're going to pass. Sometimes she declares war on you by this time. And that's fine as well. Alright, we got our reform. Sunjian event triggered. Let's continue this way. We're headed for here. We got another armor. Like I said, we get a lot of armor as Zhang Yan for some reason. Alright. So let's take this. Alright, so we finally migrated. I got some extra experience. On top of that and you just have to build this up from scratch so you could rush it if you want um, depends on how patient you are there's no benefit to rushing it right other than you can make your game go a little faster uh, you know it makes all the economic sense in the world to actually not rush it and you're waiting for your characters to show up and what you want to do here is you might want to consider moving him 
and it's really hard to move him from commander to commandery. You basically have to remove him from office. He'll be very sad and he might actually threaten to leave you and you have to give him a temporary title, move him back, get rid of the title. It's quite a shuffle. Uh, you, or you could just wait till, you know, you lose your city, he loses his job and then move him afterward. And you always want to keep your eye out for good characters that you could recruit. Yeah, no one here. We're good to go. And uh, let's continue. Okay, so like I said, Zhong Jiang likes to declare war on us even before the first dilemma trigger sometime because of how weak we're perceived. And there's some interesting aspect to this war uh, that we'll talk about once we get to next turn, but first we'll just acknowledge this. Alright, so we gotta declare war on. And what I found uh, through my experience is that she would actually not attack your capital. And she would sail with her army to chase after us here. And by the time she gets here, obviously her army is extremely depleted from attrition. And you have a town with towers and a general who is fatigue immune. So you can just loop her till she dies. And that's really sad how they don't actually go for the town tunnel vision on what's not a capital clearly. I have yet to seen her take this town in all my experience. Let's just say that. But if she does take the town in your game, be happy because then you can start building this building that you want here. You can't build this anywhere else but your capital. So even if we get an extra slot, you can't start building it uh, until uh, we basically get this removed or we paid up 5,000 to move it right now. I think it has to do with your rank, how much it costs. Right now we don't have the bandit rank, so it's 5,000. It'll become 10,000 once we rank up and then 15,000, 20,000, 25,000. I think if you want to rush things, you can move. But once again, I see no reason to rush. Take it slow. If you're going to do a migration tactic, take it slow. All right, so extra loot in own territory faction wide. That is actually an amazing bonus to have if you're planning for the late game. You want your court to be generating your armies a lot of passive loot. If you can get them to hit 45 loot per turn just from faction-wide bonuses, then you can have armies standing on the field doing sharing the spoils forever. Because it costs you 45 loot per turn to share the spoils, and you're supposed to go out and get more loot. But because the way military supply is programmed, uh, if you get characters with background bonus that give you passive loot, and there's a ton of them because they give military supply. I think Sima Yi does this. I think Zhuge Liang does this. I think a lot of uh, characters from Cao Cao's faction does this as well. So if you can pick up these characters and you can give passive loot to your whole faction, I think Guo Si also does this as well. But anyways, uh, you'll be able to have your army just stand on the field. And obviously high cunning also give you a lot of loot. So the single armies, basically one general armies, you want to be standing out here boosting your loot. You prefer strategists. If you recruit strategists with high cunning, they can stand out here and generate a lot of loot passively and they'll be able to share the spoil for a lot longer. But he looks like a great character to recruit. He's also historically relevant. He also has a dutiful, which increases satisfaction. So we're going to pick him up here. Uh, obviously, your character is going to be different. He also has an item. Can't lose here. And he also can't take this job, right? Okay, that's definitely a program thing. Hmm. Okay, that's fine. And he can come here and do assignments just to level up while he waits. Uh, or maybe even here. There's no peasantry income. Basically, uh, everything's banditry income. Oh, and the minor settlement building here. But usually you spam black market, which is my go-to building. But this is clearly not an income commander because we're here to lose the commandery. And there's only one county. So there's no stacking of banditry income. So black market is actually not as good. Uh, the one that's good here is probably mustering ground. So if you're in a more military situation where you have to defend, you obviously want to increase your replenishment. The faction-wide redeployment cost is great. Minus five public water for adjacent enemy commander is also great because you can spawn them rebellions and they will be having a hard time dealing with those and not so busy killing you. You can also go preparatory camp to boost research rate. So if you're in late game, you're doing great in war, you don't have to be in a defensive position, you don't need replenishment. And honestly, you don't need replenishment just because you can change your stance to sharing the spoil and that gives you 25% replenishment. This is the spam to go for because you can spam a lot of research rate in these single county commanderies and that will boost all your reforms to get faster. Now, the spying cover cost also is great for stealing characters. So that's obviously an option. Food tent is something I just stay away from. 
I don't want to spend 50 upkeep per turn for the county. Uh, the population growth in the county is not significant for me because this thing maxed out at 500k and that's not going to give us like anything in terms of bonuses and we're going to lose the commandery so we're going to lose most of the population anyways uh, so I don't feel like it's worth paying 50 per turn to get like maybe 20% boost back for all income when that's all the income you have so I'm going to go with mustering ground here by that logic and at this point I think we can actually wrap up our guide uh, you're basically what you want to do here is you definitely want to grab these two counties a few things you need to note one as i said zhengjiang likes to chase after you so as you expand once you get this to a town just keep an eye out for her army and that way you can summon the general back zhang yan back here so he can loop them around another few things you might want to note is that lu bu's army or dong zhuo's army uh, doesn't i don't know which one he will send like to come and take the salt mine. This is a level two salt mine. It has a very small retinue inside. You can take it with a single general. So definitely go for it. The army of Dong Zhuo is quite passive. They don't tend to come into your territory very much. And uh, you need just to be very mindful when they do get close. And your early goal is just to build up a roster of generals, build up your territory in Shuofang. And another thing to note is, I although Animal Tamer is great, right? You get horses, it's wonderful. Don't take this one first, because the second you take this one, you don't gain vision of the enemies here, or not enemies, but factions here, but they actually gain vision of you in diplomacy. Uh, you can still trade with them, talk to them, and the people I'm talking about is Ma Tong and Han Sui, and they're in an alliance. And because you're perceived as very weak early on with no armies whatsoever, if you take this early on, you could get into alliance war with them, and that's something you just want to avoid. What you want to do early on is just maybe take the horse pasture, build these county up one at a time, and just take your time, build up your counties. Counties are very strong for bandits. They always have two full stacks, and the army composition for horse pasture and animal tamer are quite nice and you'll be able to uh, generate pretty much a great economy after you get a nice roster of generals you're happy with, some of them out in a, basically a doom stack early on and just start marching through the land and taking down enemies. And the units that you want to recruit early on is basically you know, your faction special units for Zhang Yan because you're doing a lot of ambush fights and then you want to get these shock cavalry, right? You're getting a lot of shock cavalry already, right? You already got two Xiongnu cavalry by getting this reform. Um, and then over here, these these are not that good. Um, you get more Xiongnu Cavalry from this reform. And once you get this one for campaign movement range, you get Tiang Marauders, which are fatigue immune. You can keep going and get more Tiang Raiders. Up here, you get heavy Xiongnu or Cataphracts. And then over here, you get uh, Senbei Riders. So all very good for ambush fights or for any fights, really. You have very powerful shot cavalry early on, and that's what you have to abuse. Um, so that's kind of the game plan, playing as Zhang Yan with this migration tactic. And the whole reason why we're doing it is because Shuofang is amazing here. And you can just slowly ramp up from there, get mercenary treaties when you can, because you're close to Dong Zhuo. A lot of factions is willing to deal with you by getting a mercenary treaty against him. And you'll be able to take his land and get paid at the same time. And you can decide what you want to do with Ma Teng and Han Sui. Maybe they're the partners you want for the mercenary treaties. Or maybe you can just turn on them and wipe them out uh, later on as well. And clearly you want to shuffle your way down south here. Take the west part. Get into contact with Sun Jian's faction. Because remember you're still single. And by turn 87, Sun Jian will be ready for marriage. So you can definitely try to get that to work as well. So that's pretty much it for the guide. And hope you guys enjoy this one. And have fun with Zhang Yan who is really no longer the king of the Black Mountains as we come to the northwest here. Um, but that's it. See you guys next time. Bye!